So in the last couple of videos, I've been neglecting one of our interpretations, the homotopy interpretation. In this video, I really wanted to remedy that and give us a few more examples of what spaces can look like and how type theory helps us reason about space. And so the spaces I wanted to start with are an important class of spaces in homotopy theory known as the n spheres. So for any number of dimensions n, you have the n sphere. So there's the one sphere, the two sphere, the three sphere, etc. And so we've already seen the one sphere, which is the circle. You can think of the circle as a hollow ball in two dimensions. It's a two dimensional ball with a big hole in the middle. The two sphere is what we more normally call just a sphere. It's a hollow ball in three dimensions. So it's a three-dimensional ball with a hole in the middle. And so this pattern continues. A n-sphere is a hollow ball in n plus one dimensions. And so it's an n plus one dimensional ball with a hole in the middle. And so this is the kind of thing we do in mathematics. We take familiar examples like circles and spheres and find what's the general pattern running across dimensions. But then the other thing that is important to do in mathematics is examine what are the edge cases of your pattern. In this case, our edge case is zero. What's a zero sphere? So one dimensional space is just the line. So a ball in one dimension is just going to be an interval. And so then a hollow ball, it would be if we punch a hole in the middle of that interval, getting two kind of disconnected components. And so funnily enough, we've actually already dealt with this space in homotopy type theory. This is Boole. It's just two disconnected points. And so Boole is an example of a simple but very important kind of space that we can deal with using homotopy type theory, which we call sets. In homotopy type theory, we use the term set in a specific technical sense. And later on, once we have more machinery on the table, I'll actually give you that definition of what a set is in homotopy type theory. But for now, you can think of a set as a disconnected collection of points. A set is a degenerate kind of space because it doesn't have any of the interesting spatial structure. It doesn't have any holes. It doesn't have any empty cavities. It's just a bunch of disconnected points. And so many of the interesting examples of spaces that we've talked about so far, like the circle, the two sphere, the torus, the Klein bottle, these are not sets. And later on, we're going to be able to prove that these are not sets. But even among sets, there are some interesting things to be said. Later on, we're going to have infinite sets, and we'll have ways of encoding an infinite collection of different points in homotopy type theory and dealing with that infinity. But so far, the only sets that we've seen have been finite sets. So as mentioned, Boole is a set consisting of two points. Unit is a set consisting of one point. And then the other finite set that we've seen a few videos back was a seven-pointed space, the days of the week. When we talked about the days of the week, we were viewing it from a kind of computational and logical point of view. But since we encoded it in homotopy type theory, that means it's also a space. And the kind of space it is, is a set. It's seven points that are completely disconnected from each other which just happened to be named Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, etc. And so we can do this with any number of points that we feel like. So for example, if I wanted to have a set that consists of four points, then I could define that in the way we've seen. Maybe I would call these four points spades, hearts, clubs, and diamonds. But regardless of what I call them, this would create a four-point set and I could deal with it using the tools of homotopy type theory. 
And so I encourage you to pick your favorite collection of things and encode it as a type, both in Agda and in the hot deductive calculus. Now, once again, we have a kind of pattern that for any finite number, I can define a type in homotopy type theory having exactly that many points. And I can understand it under our spatial homotopy interpretation as a space consisting of that many disconnected points in space. So again, we should examine the edge case of n equals zero. So if I try to define a type consisting of exactly zero points, what do I get? I get nothing. Or as it's better known in mathematics, I get the empty set. The empty set is the homotopy type consisting of zero things. There are no closed terms of type empty. So let's go through our usual development, starting with Agda. So let's remind ourselves how we introduce these nice finite types in our type theory. So going all the way back to unit, remember that we introduced unit using the data keyword just like this. So we said this line about data, and then we gave the constructors of the unit type. Similarly, bool, we had this line about bool is a type L0, and then we gave the constructors of the bool type. And so if you want to do the same for the empty type, then that's going to be really easy. We just say data empty is a type. And then on the next line, we just leave it blank. And so when you give these kinds of inductive definitions, it's important to always put the constructors on the next line, because if you don't, then Agda will think that you're just defining the empty type again by giving no constructors. And so this defines a type where I have no way of building anything of that type. Now, the other thing that we did for our types was give a iteration rule. So remember, for the Booleans, this is what our iteration will look like, is that it took in a couple of arguments. In this case, it took in two arguments of our type A. And then it gave us back a function from bool to A. And we didn't write the iteration rule explicitly for unit, but it would look something like this, that if we want iter of unit, then it would just need to take a single term of type A, and then it would give us back a function from unit to A. And so we would write that like this, that iter of unit, and then our argument A, well, that would just be lambda star to A. So there's our iteration rule for unit. Notice that these follow a kind of common pattern, that the iteration rule for Booleans took, took in two arguments of this whatever type A, and then based on the whichever Boolean we gave, it gave back one or the other. And then unit, the iteration rule just took in one and gave us back a function that always just returned us that. And so following the pattern, for the empty type, it's going to take in zero arguments of type A, and then it'll give us back a, a function from empty to A. So first, I will, I will make the abbreviation of this bold zero is equal to empty, kind of following our convention so far. And then we will define iter empty, which just gives us back a function of 0 to a. 
And so when we go through the logical interpretation of what the empty type is, then this is going to be something that we care a lot about. But for now, let me just introduce the syntax for defining this, because our usual syntax for defining this of, of using a lambda to define a function isn't really going to work because there's not really a way of if I if I'm given a if I'm given something of type zero, I should be able to produce something of type A. That doesn't quite make sense because because zero shouldn't have anything of that type. And even if I had something of that type, it's not obvious how I would leverage that to build something of this type A. But thankfully, Agda has a specific syntax for defining this, and it's just open bracket, close bracket here. And so this is a very special, this is a special notation just for dealing with this specific case. But this is the iteration rule for empty. And so now if I ask what type is iter, iter empty, it says, this is kind of saying for any type whatsoever, then, then iter zero is a term of type zero arrow A. So that's the empty type in Agda. And similarly, we have to take special care to deal with the empty type in our deductive calculus, just because the empty type is so weird. Remember that our normal development of a type consisted of giving a formation rule, an introduction rule, an iteration rule, and computation rules. The formation rule is basically the same as with unit and bool. We just say, in any context, there is a type which we call empty. So empty is a type. But the funny thing is that we don't have an introduction rule because there's not supposed to be any way of introducing terms of this type. And so we simply don't have an introduction rule for empty. There is none. And remember that our computation rules were about how what happens when you apply the iteration rule to things that you introduced using the introduction rule. And so if we don't have an introduction rule, there's no need for computation rules either. So scratch that out. And then I'm going to leave the iteration rule for you to write. If you need an example, I would look back at how what we did for unit and bool and how the agda formalization of computing with this type relates to the formal iteration rule. But to close this video, let's jump back into informal hot and interpret what this type means in each of our three interpretations. We've already kind of covered what the homotopy interpretation of the empty type is. It's the empty space. It's the void. It's nothingness. If sets are a degenerate kind of space that lacks any interesting spatial structure, then the empty type is a degenerate kind of set, which doesn't contain anything at all. Moving over to our, our programming interpretation, the empty type is not going to be all that interesting. Usually when we're working with types in programming, we actually want to write terms of that type. And so there's not a too much programming use for having a empty type. But it's in our logic interpretation that the empty type is going to be really, really important. So remember that our logic interpretation was that a type is a proposition or a claim and that the terms of that type are proofs or witnesses to the truth of that claim. So I'm going to leave it to you to think about what does an empty type represent in our logic interpretation. Later on, I'm going to do a video about it and discuss it more thoroughly because the empty type is one of the most important, if not the most important type in our logic interpretation. So that's all for this video. In our next video, we're going to talk about a way of combining different spaces in order to get new and more fascinating ones. So see you next time.